River Phoenix was an Academy Award nominee and considered one of his generation's most talented actors. Sadly, the actor's promising career was cut short by his unexpected death on October 31, 1993. When tragedy struck, Phoenix started work on Dark Blood with Jonathan Price and Judy Davis. During a break in filming, Phoenix went out to the Viper Room, a popular nightclub partly owned by Johnny Depp, with his brother Joaquin, his sister Rain, and his girlfriend Samantha Mathis. Today on Death by Misadventure, I join acclaimed author of the book, Last Night at the Viper Room, Gavin Edwards, to talk about what happened to River Phoenix that fateful night. In his book, Gavin vividly recounts the life and tragic death of River Phoenix, a teen idol on the fast track to Hollywood royalty, who died of a drug overdose in front of West Hollywood's nightclub, The Viper Room, at the age of 23. In our conversation, Gavin chronicles the young star's life, including his childhood in Venezuela, growing up in the cult Children of God, and his rise to fame. We explore the dark side of the 1990s and River Phoenix's lasting legacy on Hollywood and popular culture. I'm JC Nova, and this is Death by Misadventure. What inspired you to write The Last Night at the Viper Room? The actual spur was that I was asked. But when I was asked to write the book, I had to sort of take a day or two to think about, is this something I want to do and really consider my relationship with River Phoenix? And the thing that I really dwelled on was just this like late night. And it felt like just this fever dream that I had had, that there was sort of, it was beautiful and it was poetic and then it was gone. And I just always remembered sort of the strangeness and the intensity of that. And I think that was what I really like clung to as I started working on the book, thinking about like that vision of River Phoenix and what he was able to do on screen and then wanting to like sort of unfold it all and know more of the story behind it. What surprised you about River Phoenix when you were researching the book? And there's a lot of stories that have been told about what his life was like growing up in a cult. And I would just like to get your perspective of what it was like for River growing up and how he got involved in acting. The single thing that surprised me the most when I started working on the book was his childhood, uh, that there had been like little sort of like hints and references like in uh, the press when he was alive, but nobody had ever really put it together during his lifetime. But when you do, it's quite alarming and disturbing. His family joined a cult called Children of God, and they were sent down to Venezuela to be missionaries. And the cult was very much about sex, like as a sacrament towards Christ. Okay. But it extended, you know, sort of like to something called like sort of flirty fishing, which was encouraging the women in the cult to basically go out and be prostitutes to like A, bring in powerful men, but B, to like help finance the cult. And since sex was a sacrament, it also extended towards the children having sex, you know, sort of both with each other and with adults. So River was routinely sexually abused. He very, very rarely talked about it, but he said that, you know, he was sexually active between the ages of four and 10. And so, you know, it's remarkable that he came out of that in some ways that, you know, sort of like a lot of people who knew him sort of like saw him as just having like all this like positive life force. Um, It didn't seem that like it broke him, but you have to think that, you know, this is, such a heavy weight for like any child and for any human being to carry around of having that happen for so long. And you can only speculate about like how that formed his personality and turned him into the person he was. What was River's relationship like with his parents? His father, you know, had problems with alcohol. How do you think that impacted River growing up? River was a part of a very large, very close family. You know, he had lots of brothers and sisters. The mom was sort of like the, who was Arlen or Hart Phoenix, was very much the one pushing things forward, whereas the dad at a certain point sort of thought it was corrupt. But I think the real fundamental sort of family dynamic was that River was in a position where he was 
financially responsible for the entire family from a very young age, that his father like had thrown out his back and wasn't able to do sort of the landscaping work that he had once done to make money. So the family got into show business and River was the one earning money. And that's a lot of weight for a young child, that if you don't get the part, the family doesn't have any place to eat. How did they leave the cult? Did you discover, you know, how old was River when they escaped Children of God? The family became disillusioned with the cult and decided that they wanted to come back home to the United States. I believe River was seven when that happened. So they certainly didn't have enough money for, I think they needed six plane tickets to get back to the United States. There was a local minister that they had become friendly with who arranged for the family to get on a boat and go to Miami that way. It seemed like an adventure to the kids. It also, incidentally, is the moment when the Phoenix family became vegan, which ended up being one of the important things in River's life. Do you think River's unconventional upbringing and one that was rooted in trauma was the main reason why he became a drug addict? How old was he when he started experimenting with drugs? River's first exposure to drugs, he was still young. He was a child actor, and he was starring in Stand By Me, and he got turned on to smoking pot. And this isn't something that he ever discussed. I have to think that he was attracted to pot and alcohol from a young age, and then later, like, heavier drugs. There was something he was trying to blot out. If you're carrying around that much pain, no matter how you maneuver around it, Do you think that based on because he started off with, you know, Children of God cult, then he got involved in Hollywood, and obviously Hollywood can take advantage of of young people, do you think that fueled his addiction, the Hollywood machine, basically? I don't think so. I think it is more that Hollywood is really good at enabling the stars and people with power. There's a permission structure that you can do what you want as long as you're showing up in front of the cameras and making sure that other people are getting to make their movies and getting paid. And so you can look back and you can say that there's lots of people who failed River as a caretaker, like adults working on movies who turned him on to drugs, babysitters who were looking after him, who were around when he did more serious drugs for the first time. I think there was a lot of people around River who sort of failed in their responsibility to look after River. Now, River was also very good at dodging responsibility, telling different people different stories. He would tell you what he wanted to hear. But There were people along the way who came and challenged him and said, hey, River, you have a problem. He's like, no, no, not me. That's just a rumor. But there's a lot of people around him who should have said, this kid has a problem and done more to take care of it. And so I don't think Hollywood collectively made an effort to get him hooked on drugs. But I think there's a lot of people in Hollywood who could have done more to look out for him. Based on your research for the book and everyone that you interviewed, How would you describe River Phoenix as a person or a character, his personality? The thing that really stood out to me was that the several people that I spoke with said that River had this luminous quality to him, that you met him and it felt like he was lit from within. And maybe that's just another way of saying that he's charismatic and he looks good on a camera, but it didn't feel like that. It felt like something that they still marveled at decades later. You know, here was this young man who just seemed to glow. And so the people who knew him best and loved him, they would speak about his great enthusiasm, his great passion. There were things that he deeply cared about, which included veganism, which included trying to make the world a better place and like looking after the rainforest, that he had in many ways very like hippie, crunchy ideals, but they were sincere. And he really wanted to not just be a famous pinup movie star. He wanted to make art, and he also wanted to use his power as a celebrity to make things better. When he was at his best, he was this lively, creative, sort of like crunchy young man. And because he had this different unconventional upbringing, he was sort of expanding parameters of like what a movie star could be. And I think that's part of why the public responded to him, both in that he had that glow 
and that he had a slightly uh, different set of ideals than most of the people you would see in movies and TV shows. Can we talk about what happened to him the last night he died? I have read the story about, and maybe you can walk me through it. I read that he had gone to a party, I believe in Hollywood Hills, and he was with Leonardo DiCaprio and his brother and sister and a group of people. And they were heading out to the Viper Room because it was the opening night and there was several artists playing there. What happened to him the last night he was alive? October 30th, 1993, River Phoenix was in the middle of making a movie called Dark Blood, directed by George Sleazer. And that had been out in the desert filming. He had had time to detox while he was making the movie. And this had come actually after several movies in a row where he just did not look good, did not look healthy on screen. The movie was never really finished properly because River died in the middle of it. But I've seen footage of it, and it is actually both encouraging and heartbreaking because you can see that River was like getting better. He looked like himself again on the screen. The spark was there. He was groping his way back to health and maybe sobriety. But they went to Hollywood. They were going to be filming some interiors and he was apprehensive about it. And he said, I'm going to the bad, bad town. They had a day of shooting and River is staying at the Hotel Nico and uh, his uh, brother and sister are uh, with him. And uh, they, they really want to go out to like the new hot nightclub in town, which is the Viper Room, which has been opened by uh, Johnny Depp. It's not opening night, but it's not been open very long. And, you know, sort of like they're in town. That's what they want to do. They're underage, but nobody seems to think it's going to be a problem for them to get in. River, his first impulse was, you know what? Go have a good time. I'm just going to stay in the hotel room and get ready for shooting tomorrow. And they sort of head out down the hallway, and then just as they're about to get to the elevator, he changes his mind. He wants to look after them. He uh, doesn't want to be alone, whatever reason. He goes along. Uh, his uh, girlfriend, uh, S- uh, Samantha, is there as well. And uh, he's like, wait for me. He grabs his guitar, and they go up to a party in the Hollywood Hills. It's thrown by a couple of actors. It's a Halloween party, so some people are dressed up. And at this party also was uh, young Leonardo DiCaprio. And one of those things where the party is so crowded, there's a hallway that is sort of like a two-way traffic situation and you can't stop because if you do, you're obstructing about like 20 people behind you in either direction. And DiCaprio sort of spots River, who was one of his huge heroes at that point, somebody they really like looked up to as an actor and had been a model for what he might want to do with his own career. And he wants to have a moment with him, but he can't stop there because like they're in the middle of this hallway. And he figures, well, I'll catch him later at the party, or maybe if not, I'll catch him some other time. We have the rest of our lives for me to tell him how much he means to me. So they leave the party. They go on to the Viper Room. And Johnny Depp is playing uh, on stage that night. Johnny, of course, is the co-owner of the Viper Room. He's got a bunch of his friends in a band with him. It's Al Jorgensen from Ministry. There's a Gibby from the Butthole Surfers. There's Ben Montench from Tom Petty's band. I think originally uh, River had uh, thought like, oh, I'm going to jump up on stage with them. I brought my guitar. But in fact, you know, like the stage is so tiny and there's so many people already on it. It becomes clear that like that's not going to happen. And so he's at the Viper Room. He's having a good time. And so there's multiple different versions of exactly how, like, River took the fatal overdose. And I think at a certain point, you have to say you will never know the exact details of it because it was a dark nightclub. Many of the people who were, might have been witnesses, were messed up in one way or the other. And human memory is fallible. The way that I heard it was that this river was actually offered a dose and said, hey, drink this, it'll make you feel fabulous, and downed it without even asking what was in it. And it was a speedball that contained both uh, heroin and cocaine. Now, I have that story from a reasonably reliable source. On the other hand, it's a very unusual way to take drugs in liquid form instead of like snorting it or taking it. But regardless, it got into his system And because he had dried out in the desert, it was maybe not even the most powerful dose, but he no longer was habituated to it. And pretty quickly, it was more than his body could handle. He went into seizures. He was hustled out into the sidewalk. And he was just sort of flailing around there, 
dying on the sidewalk. They pretty quickly figure out, you know, he needs to go to a hospital. There was this sense of not wanting to take him originally because they knew it would be a PR debacle, but it had to happen. And so the way that his brother, Joaquin Phoenix, first came to the attention of the American public was the 911 calls of him calling up the operator, pleading, please send somebody over. My brother is dying. And it is just heartbreaking because you can sort of hear what he's watching and he worships his brother and he's having to watch him die on the sidewalk in front of him. And it turns into, it's a Saturday night that becomes Halloween at midnight. There's River Phoenix outside the, the Viper Room and costumed people walking up and down Hollywood Boulevard. And he dies right there. How did his death impact his family and friends? His death was obviously shattering for his family and friends. It's entirely possible that Joaquin Phoenix would have never become an actor if the river had not died. Somebody else in the family like needed to do that. And so he sort of stepped forward after his brother died. And it's not necessarily the path he would have chosen if that hadn't happened. Everyone else had to sort of carry around the weight of the sorrow. It's just like a senseless tragedy. So it's like any death. It's horrible and it's permanent and you have to, the survivors have to live with it. Do you believe that his death is reflective of the fate of several child actors in Hollywood? Obviously, child actors in Hollywood, the odds aren't great. There are some who have grown up to be intelligent, well-balanced human beings. And then there's just way disproportionately many who are just sort of like walking disaster areas. I asked Ethan Hawke once if he had a kid who was interested in getting into show business as a child actor, would he recommend it? And he's like, I just don't think it's a good idea. And actually, Macaulay Culkin said the same thing to me as well. And I think there's just no way to have the grounding and like uh, the normalness that you need to succeed as an adult of any type, let alone as an actor in a business that is inherently strange and unbalancing. Being a child actor is not a death sentence, but there's a reason that so many child actors have a very hard time. Do you think that River had a sense of foreboding that his life would be short-lived, or did any of his friends or family talk about him having a sense that his time would be limited on Earth? I uh, can't recall anyone saying his years are numbered, he's only going to be with us for a short time. I think he knew he was putting himself into a dangerous situation, and the worse things got, the more people around him started to worry and say, he's playing with fire. There's so much randomness in any life that, you know, there's like a version of River's story where he doesn't go out that night, but then maybe he relapses three months later with the tragic effects, or maybe he gets clean and gets into a car crash like a year later. Like, we have no way of knowing But I don't think most people thought like, oh, River's doomed. The people were worried about him. One of the things that I was really struck by after his death was that there was this immediate sort of sense that he was only going to get more and more legendary. One thing that struck me in talking, one of my friends had had died a few months before River, but he was murdered. And he was 25 years old. So when we talk about him and I talk with him with his family and stuff, who I'm very close to, you know, to us, when you lose someone who's young, they're frozen in time. Yes. They live, they're young forever. We all, you know, grow and age and get old and, you know, get married, have children. And they're just forever stuck in time, which in one side can be very beautiful. You remember them when, you know, they're at the the top of their life, hopefully. When I think of River Phoenix, I'm just curious how people talk about him. I remember him in the last couple years of his life and thinking he's such a talented actor. He's so handsome. What is the word I'm looking for? It's like suspended in time. Yeah. Frozen in amber. Yeah. I like what that term you used, frozen in amber. Him being an actor, frozen in time. River. He didn't make that many movies. He made a dozen movies. Some of them are just not that good. And some of the best ones, you know, sort of like have been forgotten. 
He's excellent in running on empty. His best adult work was in my own private Idaho. And you have Stand By Me, which is in some ways his most famous performance, but he was just really young at that point. He's almost a symbol, having been the actor at that time, even more than he's like a memory. Who he is is frozen in amber. And there's this feeling of he's never going to like get old. He's never going to make the different mistakes. And we can only imagine what sort of actor he would have become. And, you know, like I think about the trajectory of his life and his own brother, Joaquin Phoenix, steps up and works in the same vein. And so you can sort of imagine this like sort of like shadowy remix of those two careers that add up to, you know, sort of like what River Phoenix's career as an adult might have been. But we're never going to know. All we have of River Phoenix is a handful of performances and whatever way they touched you, especially if you were like alive and around when he did them. Do you believe in fate? Like him him being able to, you know, get discovered as an actor and all the decisions that he made in his life that it ultimately led to his death. I believe that River Phoenix was the master of his own destiny and that it was not preordained that this was what was going to happen to him. I do think that the human tendency is you see somebody's life and you want to make a story out of it because we're storytelling animals and we want a narrative. But it's pretty easy to do in this case. You can see like the different things that affected him and that sort of colored his life, and it leads both to the glory of his life, and it also leads to his death. When you think of uh, River Phoenix as an actor, are there other actors today that you would compare him to? That's a good question. I would say, and you know, like, I'm not saying he has the same childhood or the uh, same experiences or problems that River does, but the actor who most reminds me of River Phoenix today is Timothy Chalamet. They sort of look like each other. Some of that is just sort of like his fearlessness. And I think that at his best, River was willing to throw himself into parts. And that was both like the great boon, that it meant that he had some really powerful performances. He was an actor who was still figuring out how to uh, separate uh, life from performance. And I think that ended up being his Achilles heel. My last question is, like, do you think that River Phoenix would have achieved the same success as his brother Joaquin or even Johnny Depp or Leonardo DiCaprio? Do you think that he would have continued to be an actor or perhaps may have just kind of gone behind the scenes and focused more on being like a producer or director? Anything is possible. There were certainly people who wanted, I mean, River's father in particular, like was always encouraging him to basically like drop out. You've made a whole pile of money. You can get out of Hollywood. But I don't think that's actually what River wanted. I think River loved the performing. His biggest conflict in some ways uh, in relation to performance was that he wanted to make it both as an actor and as a musician. I think he would have had a decades long career and would have become, you know, sort of like a senior citizen of acting. And I actually believe that if not for this dumb mishap, he would have sort of like gotten out of his youthful abuse problems and put it together. And he had something that was special, like his peers just watching him on screen, like knew that he had it. And I think he didn't want to hide that light. He wanted to share it. To learn more about Gavin Edwards, visit his official website at rule42.com. That's R-U-L-E-F-O-R-T-Y-T-W-O dot com. The book, Last Night at Viper Room, is available for purchase at Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. A special thanks to sound engineer Parker Ginn and audio producer Christopher Lang. This episode was recorded at Laguna Sound in Laguna Beach, California. Don't forget to subscribe to Death by Misadventure on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks for listening.